today hi girls today we are going to be looking at absolute monarchs we just finished up with um mesoamerica and we are moving forward with um the age of absolute monarchs um so we knew that by the end of the renaissance new nations were being formed in europe many of these nations were ruled by powerful kings with unlimited power when power is unlimited it's known as absolute power and by limited what we mean what we mean by limited is that you know in the united states the president can't do whatever he wants he is limited by um checks and balances and separation of powers that are established by the government in this age of absolute monarchs, there was no such thing as, hey, king, you can't do that, right? They had the most power, absolute power. Um, the era from the 1600s to the mid 1700s was known as the age of absolutism, right? How did European kings gain so much power? Let's check it out. Move forward. So during the Middle Ages, European kings were not very powerful, right? Um, instead, the feudal lords had real power because they controlled local manners and had the loyalty of kings. Catholic Church was the dominant religion, and the Pope had power over the peasants. The Crusades simulated trade and led to the rise of cities in Europe. Feudalism was on the decline, and so the power of kings increased. Okay. If you look back here, this trade network that we see that was kind of brought about by the Crusades um, sparked the Renaissance and weakened the power of feudal lords. We had the Hundred Years' War, new weapons like the cannon and longbow weakened the power of the nobles and the knights. Okay. Um, feudalism declined, the power of kings increased. Catholic Church is weakened, uh, Protestant Reformation takes place. The power of the church declines, and so the power of kings is increasing, right? This is kind of like a review. We looked at this and we looked at um, Henry VIII, right? But it, it gets, it, this is more in depth as we, as we continue moving forward. Um, so during the Renaissance, European kings taxed merchants and bankers and used wealth to build powerful armies, right? They're building up, they're building up their empires. Monarchs use their power to build centralized governments to control their nations. If a government is centralized, it means that all of the power is in the government. The people don't have power, right? The people don't have a choice. Um, when you think about the United States, right? Um, we have a government, but power is not centralized in government because people have the right to vote. Uh, there's no such thing as voting for a king. Some monarchs used... Um, overseas exploration to gain colonies and increase their wealth and power. All right. By 1600, some European kings had become absolute monarchs, meaning that they had absolute power. Um, okay. Next up, we have Philip, oops. We have Frederick the Great of Prussia. Peter the Great of Russia, Maria Theresa of Austria, Philip II of Spain, okay, and Louis the Fourteenth of France. Absolute monarchy is a government where one king holds all of the power in a country. All of the power. Um, absolute monarchs controlled all aspects of their nations, including the taxes, religion, military, and the economy. They believed in divine right. Divine right is the idea that God created the monarchy and kings answered to God, not the people. Right. So you could never argue that what a king was doing was wrong because of divine right. Anybody who would go against that would be considered blasphemous. Um, so the, the kings got their power from God. So let's look at King Philip. So as a king, Philip controlled Spain, the Netherlands, and colonies in America, but he took Portugal and its colonies in Africa and India as well. Um, this brought Spain great wealth. And so with this wealth, Philip built a strong army and the Spanish Armada. 
Philip used his navy to defend Catholicism against the English Protestants and the Ottoman Muslims. So the Spanish Armada unsuccessfully attacked Protestant England. Didn't really work out. We see the decline of Spain. So during Philip's rule, we did see a decline. So we saw gold. Um, gold led to massive inflation and prices soared. Inflation takes place when um, the cost of living goes up and the price of goods around you goes up. However, people aren't generating more income. Inflation is when there's too much money floating around the economy. You will learn a lot about this next year. Spain didn't manufacture anything to sell. Um, it bought all of its goods from other countries. So if you're constantly outsourcing and you're constantly buying from other countries and you're not exporting anything, you're not really, you're, you're not generating revenue. Um, Netherlands broke away from Spain in 1579 and inbreeding ended the Habsburg dynasty in 1700s. So that means obviously that the people were, um, you know, breeding within their families which is how you get people that look like this. Um, so how bad was the inbreeding, right? Charles' mother was a niece of Charles' father. Hmm. Maria Anna was his aunt and his grandmother. Margaret of Austria was his grandmother and great-grandmother, right? So everyone is the descendant of the same couple, Joanne and Philip I of Castile. Not great. And that's what happens. Um, Let's look at Louis XIV of France. So let's look at this portrait, right? Find three things that would show that he's an absolute monarch. Okay. His sword. His hair. His clothing. Okay. The, the luxuries around him. He's surrounded by gold. Everything's gold. All right. Before he came to power, France was in a conflict um, between Catholics and French Protestants called Huguenots. Okay. So there was conflict going on in France between the peoples regarding religion. King Henry tried to fix this issue by declaring religious toleration called the Edict of Nantes. But... After he died, Catholic leaders took control over France and ended the Edict of Nantes. And this weakened the power of the nobles and increased the power of the monarchy. Right, so we're seeing more and more power go to the monarchy now. Um, by the time he came into power, France was an absolute monarchy. Um, Louis XIV ruled France for 72 years and became the classic example of an absolute monarchy, exercising all power over the peoples. He believed that the government... L'état chesmoy. Um, he excluded nobles from government decisions and hired bureaucrats to collect taxes and enforce laws. He called himself the Sun King because he felt that French power emanated from him. He thought that um, everything revolved around him. The entire prosperity and success and function of France was because he existed. He did have a positive impact on France. His econo economic advisors used overseas colonies and mercantilism to generate new wealth. He also encouraged manufacturing to make France self-sufficient. So um, what we see here is that it's not the problem of buying too much from other countries. Here, in fact, he is encouraging France to make all of their own goods so that they can self be self-sufficient and not rely on other nations. For goods and products right so he's kind of a, a self-sufficient rather than an import export kind of guy um with this wealth oops where did i go with this wealth uh louis had built a powerful army and transformed france into the most beautiful nation in europe at the time so he has complete power and was able to to achieve all of those successes what did he do wrong he involved France in expensive wars that failed to gain new lands and led to massive debts. So basically he went into war to conquer territory and failed, right? So it was in vain. Um, for example, the war of Spanish succession. He used wealth and art to glorify himself, including constructing a massive palace called Versailles. Okay, this is an idea of what it looks like. All right. So it's like, oh, I'm so wealthy, I'm going to make all these beautiful castles in um, to honor myself. 
costs a lot of money. Costs a lot of money. And do you think that the people who build it get paid a lot? Hmm. If you see up here, it's an estimate cost of $2.5 billion in 2003. That's a lot of money. That's how much it costs to make at the time it was built. He forced 36,000 laborers and 6,000 horses to work on the project. Okay, so he could afford building a palace this extravagant because he forced the people to build it. It was basically, it was slavery. <laughs> Excuse me. That's an inside look at the castle. Okay, you can actually go in here and look at the Palace of Versailles if you want to check it out. What's the legacy? All right. He, le he uh, left a lasting legacy of debt. Um, France became the most powerful nation in Europe. However, there were massive, massive debts. Um, eventually, the French people grew frustrated and overthrew the monarchy. Okay. Um, Peter the Great of Russia. Check out this picture, right? Check out this painting. Um, what shows its accomplishments? Perhaps the, the blue sash, the gold plated bib, the gold buttons on his uniform, maybe the map, okay? Um, Russia was influenced by the Byzantine Empire, but was conquered by the Mongols, okay? Um, the red the red line indicates the border of the Mongol Empire, and then the campaigns of Genghis Khan, his successors, and then the route of Marco Polo, okay? So this is the Mongol Empire at the time. Um, Ivan III successfully liberated or freed Russia from Mongols and ruled as the first czar. Czar... Um, means Caesar or king. And so that's how we refer to um, Russian absolute monarchs as czars. Over time, czars expand at Russia's borders and increase their power over the nobles. They create an absolute monarchy. How do you expand Russia's borders? You conquer territory, right? How do you conquer territory? Typically by force. Um, so they executed military power. Um, and we are going to keep moving on to check out what else that they did, the czars of Russia. Oops, what am I doing? Eh. Okay. By the time Peter the Great became czar in 1682, Russia was a massive empire. I mean, look at it. Russia in 1689 is the entire um, dark orange area. Um, they weren't as advanced as Western European nations, though. Um, it was isolated from Western Europe and didn't really know much about these new ideas of the Renaissance. Um, so kind of like think about how the Renaissance took place, did not have an impact on Russia. Wasn't really involved in that trade network. Um, while they grew wealthy from trade and had strong economies, Russia had no advanced industries, no overseas colonies, and an economy of small scale farmers, right? They are not nearly on the same page as the wealthy European nations. Russia is very much so behind in that sense. Um, they are mostly, Russians at the time were mostly feudal peasants working for nobles called boyars. Whereas we saw the feudal system decline in the Renaissance in the um, European nations. Um, Tsar Peter the Great wanted to modernize and westernize Russia. Westernize meaning to kind of like adopt the ideals and the, um, cult not the cultural so much, but the um, political, economic, trade aspects of um, Europe, right? Obviously, Russia is to the east of, the, of Europe, Okay, half of Russia is in Europe, half of Russia is in Asia. Um, so he wants to kind of westernize Russia. Let's make, let's make Russia look kind of like what Europe does right now after the Renaissance. So in disguise, <laughs> Peter toured Europe to learn new ways to modernize Russia. Um, here is the map of Russia again. So while he was in Europe, Peter learned new ideas about shipbuilding, manufacturing, government organization, city planning, music, and fashion. Europe, I mean, Russia had not even seen any of this before. This is how modernized uh, Europe was becoming post, like, during the Renaissance. Okay? 
Let's see. So when he returns from Europe, Peter imposes new reforms to westernize Russia. He says, okay, these are things that I'm going to make mandatory in society and you must abide by them. What does he do? For example, he adopts European fashions by banning beards and veils for women. To modernize, men now have to shave their beards and women are not permitted to, um, I'm sorry, men have to shave their beards and women can wear the veils. He adopts a European calendar and he improved farming techniques, used mercantilism as an economic policy, created factories for iron and lumber, modernized his army and navy, and made himself head of the Orthodox Church. This sounds a lot like Henry, does it not? Um, Peter expanded Russia's borders, built a new European-style Russian capital um, at St. Petersburg. Okay. The legacy of Peter the Great um, what did he do? Russia became a more advanced westernized nation. However, this modernization, it was a slow process and Russia had not fully industrialized even by World War I. Uh, in fact, during World War I, revolutionaries overthrew the monarchy and created a radical new government based on socialism. Okay, let's look at England. We have Elizabeth I of England. It is quite clear, right? L let's take a look at this picture. How did monarchs in England rule differently than they did in France and Russia? Hmm. Okay, so unlike other nations in Europe, England had a limited monarchy rather than an absolute monarchy. I talked earlier about what limited meant. Limited means Think about a speed limit. It keeps you, if there's a speed limit of 10, it keeps you from going over 10 when you're driving, right? Um, if there's a limit at the grocery store as to how many paper towels you can take, right? There is a rule that keeps you from going beyond. This is the same thing when it comes to power. When we're looking at a monarchy, okay? If we see a limited monarchy, this means that the throne does not have complete and total power. There is a limit to their power. Absolute monarchy means they have absolute control. So England has a limited monarchy where the king or queen does not have total, complete control. Whereas in the previous nations that we had seen with the monarchies, like the Tsars of Russia, they had absolute control. So during the Middle Ages, uh, English nobles revolted against a cruel king who had overtaxed them. And in 1215, nobles forced King John to sign the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta was a document kind of like... Um, a constitution, but rather than granting rights to the people, like a bill of rights, the Magna Carta limited the king's power. It protected the citizens right too, but it ultimately limited the king's power. It's very important. Um, the Magna Carta created a limited monarchy and led to the formation of parliament in 1295. Parliament are the people in um, government that are kind of beneath the king or queen. However, um, they still play a super important role and represent the nation. Parliament is still around today in Europe, especially in England. Okay, we have the House of Commons and the House of Lords. These are still present today. Think about maybe to compare it to our House of Representatives and our Senate. Um, but we have opposition parties and governing parties um, and different positions like the shadow ministers, the whips, the backbenchers. We have the prime ministers. Um, Parliament is a legislative group of commoners and lords who work with the king to pass laws and taxes, right? Think of it as, you know, um, commoners are maybe the House of Reps and the lords are maybe the Senate. Um, but it pretty much works to kind of make sure that everybody in society is represented in government. It's a very early form of this limited monarchy. Okay, this is what it looks like today. All right. Here's kind of like the, um, the ancestry.com of what's going on here. So Elizabeth's father, Henry VIII, right? He transformed England during the Protestant Reformation by creating the Anglican Church. You knew this already. After his death, his son Edward became king, died at the age of 15. Uh, Elizabeth's sister Mary became queen and tried to convert England back to Catholicism. Protestants who ignored Bloody Mary were executed, given her name. 
After Mary's death in 1558, Elizabeth becomes queen, rules for 45 years, and becomes the greatest monarch in English history. It's our girl. Elizabeth refused to share power with a man and never married. She was known as the Virgin Queen. Um, during her reign, she worked with Parliament to settle important issues. One of them was to, ter to determine what religion England would be, Anglican or Catholic. During her reign, oh, I'm sorry, um, Henry VIII made himself head of the church and introduced the Bible in English, did not change church services. Um, his son Edward was strongly Protestant, introduced a new prayer book, um, had church services in English and allowed priests to marry, and he destroyed church decorations. Then we have Mary, who's strongly Catholic. She made Pope the head of the church again. Um, church services changed to Latin, and priests were not allowed to marry. Protestants were persecuted. Remember Bloody Mary? They are even executed. Then we have Elizabeth. Okay, so they passed the, her alongside with Parliament, passed the Act of Uniformity, which made Anglicanism the official religion of England. However, many Catholic traditions and rituals remained. Um, this compromise settled the religious issue in England. Mary's rival was Mary Stuart. She was the Queen of Scotland. Oops. Um... Her compromise didn't make all Catholics happy. Um, so some Catholics wanted Mary Stuart to be queen. She was queen of Scotland and was overthrown by the Presbyterians who were Calvinists. She was caught in an attempt to overthrow and execute Elizabeth. So what does Elizabeth do and respond to um, her cousin trying to kill her? Right? Hmm. Check it out. Check it out. Beheads her. So, after that family affair, um, she prompted capitalism and mercantilism by encouraging joint stock companies to invest in overseas exploration and colonization. Okay. Her, during her reign as queen, England experienced a golden age in culture, especially literature and theater. All right, we had Shakespeare and stuff. After Elizabeth's death in 1603, the Stuart family assumed the monarchy. Um, and unlike Elizabeth, Stuart kings refused to work with Parliament and tried to recreate the absolute monarchy in England. It was problematic because they were functioning with a limited monarchy where Parliament had a say. Um, Parliament and Stuart kings um, are not getting along, obviously, because Parliament does not have a say anymore, whereas they did have a say with, uh, with Elizabeth. And this leads to a series of violent civil war in 1642. And a near war in 1688 called the Glorious Revolution. Hmm. Think about the Glorious Revolution. Think about the word glorious. Um, after the Glorious Revolution, Parliament required the new monarchs to sign a Bill of Rights. We had the Magna Carta first in 1215, and now we have the Bill of Rights. Um, the king can't tax or overturn Parliament's laws. Um, it protected the freedom of speech. The army cannot be used as a police force and there's no excessive bail. These are some rights that are guaranteed to the citizens. The Magna Carta and the Bill of Rights created a constitutional monarchy in England by serving as written limits on the king's power, right? This established constitution limits the power of the monarchy, right? That's what a constitution does. It's a, it's a legal written document that grants power and prevents, um, and prevents one person from having too much power. So um, these together make kind of transition um, England from what was a limited monarchy and then an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy. It's a monarchy governed by a constitution. There's still a king or a queen, it's just governed by a constitution. Right, the US democracy, we have a constitution as well. All right, guys. So that was that. You have a couple of um, you have a couple of uh, you have like a worksheet to do that kind of talks about all of the czars and kings and absolute rulers that we looked at today. Um, so take a look at that. Um, let me know if you have any questions, and um, good luck with your assignment today.